Welcome, everyone. I'm Diana Billamore, Key Bank Professor and Chair of Organizational Behavior at Case Western Reserve University. Today's session will focus on navigating politics and gaining influence in organizations, another tool of leadership for women in organizations. Our agenda today is to discuss strategies to respond positively to political situations in organizations, strategies to enhance your personal power and influence. In this area, we will develop understanding about what is power and what is influence, and how do we develop these to be more influential and impactful in our workplaces. And our third agenda item is to develop strategies to enhance your capacity to engage collaboratively and leverage your networks and alliances. We'll start with a reflection. This puts us into the situation where you've recently experienced something political occurring in your organization. And I invite you to reflect a little bit deeply on what was happening, formally and informally. What were the precipitating factors? What were the positive and negative aspects of the situation? How was the situation managed and by whom? What were the unwritten rules in operation? Did and how did you manage up in this situation? What were the consequences and how did you feel? Please go ahead and pause for a few minutes while you undertake this reflection exercise. Let's take a few minutes to discuss organizational politics. Of course, we all experience it, but here's how some of the literature works with the definitions of organizational politics. These are actions by individuals or groups to acquire, develop, and use power and influence to obtain preferred outcomes, such as protecting their own self-interests and advancing their own goals. Now, every organization has its own invisible nervous system of connection and influence. Politics surface when there is uncertainty, that is a shifting of resources of power or any kind of change. Politics influence others' behaviors and the course of events. Now, sometimes we make the judgment that gains come at the expense of others often giving politics a negative connotation. But politics can have both positive or negative outcomes. Let's take a look at what some of the positive and the negative outcomes are. Political behavior can meet appropriate and legitimate individual and organizational needs, or politics can result in negative outcomes. Some of the beneficial effects of politics can be career advancement, the gaining of recognition and status for individuals who are looking after legitimate interests, achievement of organizational goals, and even creativity and innovation. But of course, there are also harmful effects, particularly when politics is not managed appropriately. These include loss of jobs and status for losers in the political process. Political infighting often happens. There's a misuse of resources and the creation of an ineffective, sometimes even demoralizing, organizational culture. There are many factors that foster political behavior, such as a crisis, sometimes a void in leadership. Often when there's a vacuum in leadership, it gets filled with political behavior. When there's competing coalitions or competition for scarce resources or interdependence, individual agendas or perspectives, and many other factors, these precipitate the likelihood of organizational politics. I'd like to share an example that comes out of my coaching of women executives. I'm going to call this the glass ceiling example. And once I've said the story of this woman who I coached. I invite you to reflect on the political implications as well as what she could have done to generate more positive outcomes. The story I want to share is about a mid-level manager whom I was working with as a coach. She worked in a small private company. She reported directly to the CFO. The CFO 
was a very popular guy. He would spend a lot of time out on the golf course with his colleagues and with clients of the company. Whilst he was away, she would manage the office. When he retired, she expected that she would become the CFO. She was completing her executive MBA degree at Case Western Reserve University, which is where I got the chance to coach, coach with her. And she had also received her CPA, which is a high level certification for accountants. As part of the process emerging from the retirement of her boss, the CFO, she approached the CEO of the company and asked if she could be considered for that job. It turned out that she was not even considered. She was very upset by this and decided to leave the organization and find another position somewhere else because she felt like her talents and her qualifications were not adequately reflected in the process going forward. When I was coaching with her, I asked her to go and talk directly to the CEO and ask what she could have done to be considered more positively for this position, which in many ways she was highly qualified for. She did go and talk to the CEO, and what he told her was, we wish you would not leave. And she said to him, but then why didn't you consider me for this job? And he said to her, we don't think you have executive material yet. I will close that story there, but I ask you to reflect upon what she could have done differently to generate more positive outcomes. There is a political reality at the top. Most corporations can be described as meritocracies, places where promotions are earned based on merit. Achievement and performance are emphasized. Advancement is gained through hard work. However, between upper middle management and the executive level, corporate culture nearly always shifts to a culture based on power. The change is invisible and rarely if ever acknowledged openly. To advance further, a worker must play by the new rules, even though they've never been explained. In fact, the new rules are so important to the way top teams function that even highly talented people who can't conform will be blocked or eliminated. Though few people talk about it, this is the class ceiling. So I want to just spend a, a moment describing what is a culture of teams. And I'll summarize it as being a relational culture, comprising trust, shared values and worldview, loyalty, respect, a camaraderie, a team spirit, social and professional ties, and clear boundaries of who is in and who is not in the team. This is particularly true for top executive teams who must work together very closely to achieve organizational outcomes that are positive and helpful and constructive. But at the same time, they have to take risk and they have to count on each other to support in the decisions that are being made. Sometimes extremely difficult senior leadership level decisions. It's very important to proactively manage politically charged situations, just like our coachy in the story I shared a bit earlier. We can remain on the outside, refusing to play, because we don't like the rules. But remember, those who don't play don't usually get to make or change the rules. Only the insiders, the players, have a chance to modify them. I'd like to say a word about this. Sometimes we get turned off because we don't want to play a game. We don't want to play a game. But I do want to suggest that there are some games that are honorable games. We can think of many sports examples, many tournaments, many matches that athletes play. These are honorable games. And so also there can be honor in playing 
the game in our organizations. But we do have to be insiders to make or change the rules. Now, there are many different kinds of unwritten rules about who is included and what, ways to communicate and provide feedback, how career advancement and leadership development occurs, how to gain visibility, expectations about performance and results, unwritten rules about working long hours, about putting in FaceTime, many different types of unwritten rules. On this particular slide, taken from a recent study by Catalyst out of New York City. They asked 587 men and women, what would you have wished you could have done in hindsight? And as you can see on the slide, the top few reasons, in fact, the bulk of them on the slide are about the relational connection with other people, particularly as mentors, as guides, and to open up informal networks within people's organizations. So the main piece that I want to leave with you from this slide, as well as from the previous ones, is the very important connections, networks, and mentoring relationships that are critical to gaining the influence that allows us to navigate most effectively through organizational politics. I invite you to take another reflection. Please go ahead and pause as well, just for a couple of minutes whilst you undergo some of these exercises. Do you know what the informal rules of your organization are? Describe the culture of the team you would like to join or influence. And what can you do to raise your level of political awareness regarding this team? Again, the point of this exercise is to enable you to understand the relational culture of your team and organization. Because by doing this, we enable ourselves to more effectively manage the political situation and be more positively influential and to drive the outcomes in a direction that is in your mission and vision and towards the larger goals and purpose of the organization. I want to describe two strategies for enhancing relational capital. One which we would call a broad strategy and one which is a deep strategy. The broad strategy consists of creating networks that are more entrepreneurial. These are large, diverse, flexible, and outwardly focused. Some of the ways by which we can do this is by seeking out new and wide-ranging opportunities to connect with others. For example, through professional associations and women's networks and seeking opportunities to increase overall visibility. For example, serving as a leader of a professional association or by organizing a network within your own, within your own company. A deeper set of strategies is around building the connective infrastructure within your own workplace by engaging in inclusive practices that enhance engagement, trust, mutual understanding, and valuing of diverse identities, as well as engaging in strong mentoring relationships, both serving as a mentor and being mentored, and collaborating and building alliances of trust. There are three different types of networks that I'd like to highlight. Task networks, or networks that pertain to the relationships or the exchange of job-related resources such as information, expertise, professional advice, political access, and material resources. A second type of network is what we call the career network. That is relationships with people who provide career direction and guidance, exposure to upper management, help in getting challenging and visible assignments, and advocacy for promotions. And a third kind of network Social or support networks. These are relationships at work characterized by higher levels of closeness and trust, generally among people who share common interests or background. And they are useful in mobilizing resources, transmitting information, and providing peer coaching. Take a minute, folks, to complete the network assessment ex exercise on the next slide. Please go ahead and list people from any context within a beyond your current organization with whom you engage with in a task network, 
a career developmental network, and a social support network. Put down as many names as you can, because I'm going to ask you to reflect on what you've done in just a couple of minutes. Please go ahead and pause at this point. Once you put down names into the three network columns of the previous exercise, I invite you to reflect now on the following questions. How diverse are your networks? At work, is there one network type that you rely on more than others? And what are the consequences that you have faced from this? How much of your time and energy is spent building or maintaining each of these three different types of networks? Which of your networks need to be developed further? And how will you go about doing that? Again, please pause for a couple of minutes while you reflect on what you completed in the previous exercise. I'd like to move us now to the final segment of this session, which is to focus in on power and influence. Power is the ability to take one's place in whatever discourse is essential to action and the right to have one's part matter. Influence, which sometimes we think of as more informal power, is the capacity to effect change. Now, influence refers to inspiration, stimulation, encouragement, guidance, sway. Influence is often a pull. Power sometimes is a push. You might want to think about some of the differences between being impactful through a pull or being impactful through a push. It is very important that we know our own power and influence because our self-perceptions of power and influence impact our leadership and our personal effectiveness. There are different sources of power and influence, some that come from the position or the structures in which we are embedded. These are things like the title or the position we hold, the rewards that we can coordinate, and the sanctions and punishments that we can give. There are also many other kinds of power and influence sources that come from our personal self such as expertise, values and integrity, effort or hard work, or our ethic, the example we set, the image and attractiveness that we offer, and the relationships and the connections we bring. I invite you to take a moment to reflect on which sources of power and influence do you usually draw on to be the most effective. So far, we have discussed organizational politics, power, and influence. We've noted that organizational politics, which is the use of power and influence to advance self-interest, is natural in organizations. To be the most effective in managing organizational politics, we must identify and play by the unwritten rules or the culture, which we have described as a relational culture of the teams and organizations in which we want to be a part of. We must try to ensure that our political activities have positive consequences for, for others and the organization. That is, we should use our power and influence wisely. In many political situations, collective action, acting with the backing of our networks and allies, is the most effective. And my final conclusion, which I invite you to do, is intentionally grow your task, career, and social support networks so that it enables you to become more effective in gaining power and influence, to apply them to its positive ends, and navigate the organizational politics most effectively. For our homework assignment, I invite you to complete what is called the Power Map Exercise. The details are spelled out very clearly, but the larger picture is to draw a map of your, the power distribution in a team or organization that you're interested in or that you belong to. Place yourself in it and see how you relate to others in the power map around you. Those that are helpful to you, those that are advocates for you, those who are neutral to you, 
and those who might not be supporters for you. Once you have created this entire power map, in 300 to 600 words, we invite you to write a reflection on how you may be able to join or increase your influence and relational capital on this team or organization, particularly how you may gain more support from those who have yellow circles next to their name. The assignment describes what you should give as a red, green, or yellow circle. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our next session of Women in Leadership, Inspiring Positive Change. My name is Diana Billamoria, and I'm Key Bank Professor and Chair of Organizational Behavior at the Weatherhead School of Management at Case Western Reserve University. Today's session will focus on another leadership tool for women, negotiating effectively. Our agenda will be to understand the gender gap in negotiating to develop win-win negotiation skills, learn how to employ a collaborative approach to negotiating. We'll try to understand the role of emotions in negotiating and know the key issues when women negotiate, all with the goal for helping you to develop your negotiating skills to a higher level. Let's start by defining what negotiation is. It is to confer or discuss with a view to reaching agreement. I will share with you now a series of studies that shows a, a gender gap in how men and women negotiate. We'll start with a study on starting salaries. These were done by our colleagues out of Carnegie Mellon who did a study looking at the starting salaries of students graduating with master's degrees. They found that men's starting salaries were 7.6% higher than women that translated to a $4,000 difference. But the more interesting finding that they obtained was that only 7% of women negotiated that starting salary. But 57%, which is eight times as many, men asked for more money. The frequency of negotiations differs greatly among men and women. These same researchers found that in response to the question, when was your most recent negotiation that you initiated, men responded two weeks ago. Women responded one month ago. And when was the second most recent negotiation? Seven weeks ago versus 24 weeks ago. And when is the next negotiation planned? One week ahead for men, one month ahead for women. This indicates a very large gender gap in negotiating that men initiate four times as many negotiations as women, that men take a more active approach than women in getting what they want by asking for it, that men see negotiation as a more common event than women do. And interestingly, these findings cut across all ages, professions, and education levels. Another study that was done by our colleagues at Catalyst looked at the post-MBA pay gap. They looked at graduates of the MBA programs of the 26 leading business schools in Asia, Canada, Europe, and the US. And they showed that right out of these programs, women made on average US dollars 4,600 less in their initial jobs, even after accounting for experience, time since MBA, industry, and region. These salary differences were not due to different aspirations or parenthood. They found that over time, this wage gap widens to over $31,000 mid-career. And without intervention, the lost pay accumulates to more than $431,000 over 40 years. These are astronomical differences. From small differences come huge consequences. What is called the accumulation of advantage or the accumulation of disadvantage. Like interest on capital, advantages accrue. Like interest on debt, 
disadvantages accrue. And very small differences in treatment can, as they accumulate, have major consequences in salary, promotion, and prestige. As my colleague Virginia Valian has said, mountains are molehills piled one on top of the other. Let me give another example why not negotiating is very costly. Here's an example of an age 22 equally qualified male and female who received job offers of 25,000 US dollars a year. The male negotiates and starts at 30,000. That's a $5,000 difference. Now let's assume that they receive 3% raises throughout their career. By age 60, that's a $15,000 gap. Men approximately $92,000, women approximately $76,000. The male makes more all along, accumulating to more than $360,000. And if that difference had been banked at 3% a year, that would accumulate to more than $568,000 over the course of 40 years. Again, these are huge differences. Women who routinely negotiate their salary increases will earn over $1 million more by the time they retire than women who accept what they are offered without asking for more. It's more than money, of course. For example, applicants with identical experience and performance records, but different salary histories are rated differently by employers. So even in an interview, having this exact same performance record, the exact same experience, but different salary records is costly in an interview as well. It's also that sometimes accepting less implies that you place less value on your own talents, qualifications, and contributions. Not being assertive on your own behalf can sometimes be seen as a professional weakness. It is possible that if you don't negotiate, your employer may wonder about your political astuteness. When applying for jobs, it is well known that women will underestimate their capabilities and will hold back from applying because they don't feel that they're perfectly qualified for a job. For example, as Hewlett Packard's study found, men apply for a job when they consider themselves 60% qualified for it. But women won't raise their hands until they feel 100% qualified. There are many opportunities to negotiate. Some of them are at work and some of them are at home. For example, at work, resources can be negotiated, projects, deadlines, work locations, work hours, developmental opportunities, leadership development, for example, mentoring, ideas that you have, recognition, and many, many others, I'm sure. At home, there are many opportunities to negotiate as well. Chores, vacations, social activities, kids' events, budgets, major expenses, time alone, time with family, holidays, and others as well. I invite you to just pause for a moment and reflect on which of these have you negotiated in the past month. Sometimes there are mistakes that women make with regard to negotiating, such as not realizing that asking is possible. Avoiding the negotiation even when we know it's appropriate. Having somebody else do the asking. Being uncomfortable using negotiation to advance own interests and becoming anxious or fearing the process. Putting other people's needs above their own and trying to take care of the other party in the negotiation. Holding a mindset that women should behave modestly and unselfishly and not negotiate, just accept. Another mistake is not publicizing their interests and achievements, believing that hard work alone will be rewarded. And when women do ask, they often set less aggressive goals than men do. But women are not the only ones who make the mistakes. Others make them as well. For example, if women ask, they sometimes get labeled as pushy or aggressive or difficult to work with. Others sometimes undervalue women's skills and abilities. They leave women out of the information sharing networks that are necessary 
especially for advancement to leadership. Other mistakes are that they pressure women to concede more and that the culture sometimes discourages women from asking for what they want. I invite you to take a self-reflection. Rating yourself from one to seven, one equals strongly disagree to seven equals strongly agree. I feel anxious when I have to ask for something I want. Give yourself a rating. It always takes me a long time to work up the courage to ask for the things I want. Calculate your average across these two items. Here's what some of the responses to the survey findings are. 2.5 times as many women as men feel a great deal of apprehension in the face of being asked to negotiate. Women's scores on the previous exercise tend to be higher in the five to seven range than men's are. Men describe negotiating as exciting, fun, like winning a game, whereas women describe negotiation as scary, like going to the dentist. My apologies to anyone out there who's a dentist. 86% of executive women express strong negative feelings about negotiating. For example, it makes me feel insecure or nervous. Only 14% expressed any positive emotion. For example, it makes me feel powerful or assertive. How to reduce anxiety about negotiating is a common question that I'm asked in my coaching. My recommendation is to acknowledge that there are dual goals in negotiation and find ways to achieve both, both an issue or a task-related goal as well as a relationship goal. This is very important for women whom, as we know, engage more in a relational connection. So it is not a good idea to ask women to drop that. Rather, they should integrate their relationship goals with the task-related goals as well. So by focusing on both goals, the dual goals in negotiation, women can become more effective in negotiating. And a second strategy for reducing anxiety about negotiating that I offer is to ask on behalf of others. Again, this is part of the relational connection that are women's strengths. By asking on behalf of other people, the team or the organization, women can be more effective and more recognizing the opportunities to negotiate with others. There are a few constructs that I want to bring up regarding negotiation. The first one is interest-based negotiation, which is the opposite of position-based. Interest-based addresses the needs and wants that underlie our positions, rather than focusing on the positions themselves. By finding ways to satisfy the interests of both parties and finding ways to maintain or improve the relationship, interest-based negotiation can result in a win-win. Position-based often creates a stalemate or people not willing to change their positions. But when we approach it from the aspect of the interests of both parties, we can find the common ground. Of course, the first step is to know what you want. Audre Lorde said, when I dare to be powerful, to use my strength in the service of my vision, then it becomes less and less important whether I'm afraid. Another construct about negotiation that I'd like to bring up for your attention is what is called the BATNA. BATNA refers to the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. B-A-T-N-A, -A, BATNA. It's the course of action you take if a deal is not possible. That is what you can do if you fail to reach agreement. It gives you walk away power. Those entering a negotiation must have at least a tentative answer to what is your BATNA before you conduct negotiations. This is very essential because if you don't know what your BATNA is, you're not able to negotiate effectively for what you want. Another tip that I can give is that it's not just sufficient to know your BATNA. You should try to figure out the other side's BATNA. What did they have to have before they will walk away? So some suggestions for a win-win negotiation is to reframe the negotiation as an interest-based problem solving. 
Equip yourself with difficult negotiations by doing your homework. Know what you want and what the other side wants and identify each as BATNA. Try not to accept the first offer given. To many, this indicates your business naivete. Be creative in what you ask for. You may be able to get many things that will help you succeed. Always be pleasant and friendly in negotiations. This is particularly important for women. Don't threaten. And again, my practice advice is to practice asking for more than what you would normally ask for. A couple of other suggestions for effective negotiating is about balancing empathy and assertiveness. In a negotiation, a fundamental challenge is to strike an effective balance between empathy and assertiveness. Empathy involves effectively understanding your counterpart's perspective and expressing their viewpoint in a non-judgmental manner. And assertiveness is the ability to express an advocate for your own needs, interests, and perspectives. This is the dual goals that women find to be the most effective in negotiation. Empathy or care, or the relationship, the concern for the relationship, and assertiveness, or the task-related or issue-focused needs, interests, and perspectives. By balancing between these, women can be most effective in negotiation. To develop empathy, ask your counterpart to present their view before you present yours. Learn to listen without judgment. And make it clear that your understanding does not necessarily indicate agreement. To develop assertiveness, practice your story. Say out loud what you want, why, and how you can help the other side meet their needs. Revise and rehearse what you say until it is strong and persuasive. And make a list of your own key points so that you will be able to remember them when the negotiation begins. With these tips for developing empathy and assertiveness, women can achieve the dual goals of task and relationship in negotiation. I want to also now sh spend a few minutes on emotions in negotiation. Abundant research shows us that strong emotions lead to unproductive decision-making at the bargaining table. For example, being in an angry mood as compared to being in a neutral mood leads us to make more simplistic and irrational decisions blame others when things go wrong, and make overly optimistic risk estimates. In addition to anger, sadness is also an emotion that can have damaging consequences on negotiation. Sadness, like anger, also can have detrimental effects on negotiation. When we're in a sad mood, as compared to being in a neutral mood, we're more likely to sell our possessions for lower prices, we're more likely to purchase new items for higher prices, and we become fixated on initial offers. These are all damaging consequences for effective negotiation. I invite you to assess your approach to conflict, to learn to identify and control your tendencies in the face of conflict. Examine whether negotiation triggers within you a tendency towards aggressiveness, accommodation, avoidance, or trying to take care of or protect the other party. By thinking about how you are likely to respond in a particular context, you can begin to replace your unproductive negotiation strategies with more rewarding ones. These are tips that have come from the program on negotiation at the Harvard Law School. The tips on empathy and assertiveness and balancing between these, the tips about managing your emotions so that you don't let anger or sadness or other emotions derail your negotiation outcomes, and assessing your approach to conflict so that you can become more aware of your default strategies when you're faced with uncomfortableness or conflict. These are strategies that have been proposed by the program on negotiation at the Harvard School of Law. I want to point out a word of caution 
about the ways of asking that work best for women. Our colleagues at Carnegie Mellon, in their study of starting salaries of men and women graduates after master's degrees, noted all of these studies tell us that when women go into negotiation, in addition to arming themselves with information, ideas, and resolve, they must also bring along an arsenal of friendly, non-threatening social mannerisms. They must be prepared to be cooperative and interested in the needs of others, and they must avoid being confrontational. This does not mean that they need to back down. Again, what this points out is that the most effective ways of asking for women tend to be those that balance empathy and assertiveness, that are indicative of the relational as well as task goals, and that women come across in ways that are friendly and non-threatening. In conclusion, reframe negotiation as interest-based problem solving with the goal of finding a win-win solution, recognize more opportunities to negotiate, practice how you negotiate so that you increase your sense of self-efficacy and feel a sense of control over the process, know your BATNA and theirs, balance empathy and assertiveness when negotiating, understand the role of emotions in negotiating, use a friendly style, and learn to negotiate from your authentic best self strengths, not mimicking how someone else negotiates, but drawing on your own self-confidence, your authenticity, your self-efficacy, in order to be the most effective at negotiating. Our homework assignment for this session is a negotiation practice where we're going to ask you to actually go out and undertake a negotiation. This is an exercise that will help you to bring together all of the different elements we've discussed here. So we invite you to choose either a friend with whom to role play a negotiation or to actually engage in a real negotiation. Whichever one works for you. And we ask you to first think through what is the interest-based negotiation questions and tips that were provided and how do they reflect on your own behaviors. We ask you to reflect on your BATNA and identify their BATNA. Practice and prepare. And once you're ready, we ask you to go forward with an actual negotiation, either as a role play or in reality. When you've done this, we ask you to write your reflections about the experience you had and what it felt like to negotiate and how you plan to improve on your negotiations in the future. If you've role played this negotiation, make sure to gain feedback from your partner as well. Thank you very much. Hello everyone. Welcome to our final session of our Women in Leadership Inspiring Positive Change course. I'm Diana Bellamoria, Key Bank Professor and Chair of Organizational Behavior at the Weatherhead School of Management at Case Western Reserve University. Today's session is about purposeful career development for women. Our agenda will be to help you to define your own success and to gain enhanced clarity about career planning and work-life integration issues. And we'll wrap up this course by giving an overview of what we've accomplished over the past several sessions. Let me start by a quotation from Mary Catherine Bateson's book, Composing a Life, where she says, Life is an improvisational art form, and the interruptions, conflicted priorities, and exigencies that are a part of all our lives can and should be seen as a source of wisdom. Let me invite you to reflect on what is your life's wisdom 
from where does your wisdom come? Pause for just a moment and take the time to reflect on this magnificent quote. And then, where does wisdom come for you? The trajectory of women's lives and careers is multiplex. As Ruth Ellen Jocelyn said in revising herself, there is no single trajectory of women's lives. Women rebalance and reshape themselves, striving for harmony of the parts, responding to the exigencies of living in society, and creating a whole where the pieces best fit. Multiple roles are very beneficial to us because they provide opportunities for women to succeed and to feel good about themselves. And they provide more opportunities for managerial learning as well as significant opportunities for support. Brian Dyson, who was the CEO of Coca-Cola Enterprises some years ago, devised a game. Please follow this and see if you can reach some conclusions about your own priorities. Imagine life as a game in which you are juggling five balls in the air. You name them, work, family, health, friends, and spirit. And you're keeping all of these in the air. You will soon understand that work is a rubber ball. If you drop it, it will bounce back. But the other four balls, family, health, friends, and spirit, are made of glass. If you drop one of these, they will be irrevocably scuffed, marked, nicked, damaged, or even shattered. They will never be the same. You must understand that and strive for balance in your life. I invite you to undertake the following exercise. It has two parts to it and then a reflection. In the first part, which we will call life role exercises current, fill in the pie chart below, showing the percentage of time that you currently spend on your various life roles, such as work or family, children, spouse, partner, parents, friends, self, community. Literally divide up the circle as if it were a pie chart by your current spending of time on these various life roles. The second part of this exercise is to do the same pie chart over, this time looking at the ideal percentage of time that you would like to spend on various life roles. You can use the same life roles as you use in the first part of the exercise, in the current, and just now fill in what you would like to do in terms of your ideal. Once you've accomplished both of these uh, pie charts, I invite you to reflect and you may go ahead and pause so that you take the time to make some notes for yourself about these. What insights emerged from the two pie charts, the real versus the ideal, so the current or the real versus the ideal? What learnings can you transfer from one role to an others? So in each of those areas in your pie chart, what can you take from one and inform the others? And how can you start moving closer to your ideal allocation of time in various life roles? I'll move us along to the second aspect, which is about success. Particularly for women, there are multi-dimensional definitions encompassing all life spheres and changing over time. Success can be defined both objectively and subjectively. Objectively in terms of material gain, subjectively in terms of inner satisfaction. Success in career and success in relationships with others are most important for women. My colleague, Dr. Deborah O'Neill, when she was doing her dissertation under my guidance, interviewed more than 60 women from a variety of professions and organizations and determined that women's definitions of success can include any combination of the following as well as others, such as adding value and contributing and having a positive impact on others, personal fulfillment and happiness, meaningful relationships, 
recognition, achievement, accomplishment, and challenge, and financial considerations and material wealth. We invite you now to define your own success by filling in the blanks. To me, success means to achieve this success, I need to. As a successful woman, I... Please go ahead and fill in these blanks. Pause the session for now as this exercise will enable you to gain more insight about the priorities and the values of what success means to you to be more effective as a leader in your organization. I'd like to move us on to discussing different phases of women's careers. My colleague, Dr. Deborah O'Neill and I did a study that looked at the different careers of women and how they've progressed through age-related phases. We call these three phases idealistic achievement, phase two pragmatic endurance, and phase three reinventive contribution. I would like to spend a little bit of time going through each phase and I invite you to see where you are so that you can inform yourself with regard to the strategies, the locus of control, and the key issues that you face in this stage and in the coming stages as well. Phase one, which we defined as idealistic achievement, tended to be for women who were in the age range of 24 to 35. These women were proactive and strategic. They carried what was called an internal locus of control. That means they felt in charge of their own career direction. They were achievement oriented and viewed their own careers as opportunities to make a difference and as paths to personal happiness and fulfillment. They faced a future of unlimited possibilities and held the expectation of having a successful career and family. The key issues that we identified as being emblematic of this phase of career development was self-confidence and identity. In phase two, what we call pragmatic endurance, women tended to be in the ages of 36 years to 45 years. They were juggling multiple professional and personal responsibilities and demands on their time. Often they were torn between career and life choices. They were impacted by negative managers, non-supportive workplaces, and experiences of sex discrimination or sexual harassment. They viewed their careers as an extension of self and defined their success as personal happiness and fulfillment. The interesting part was they did not see their career as a path to get there. For many of the women in this stage, there tended to be a struggle, often between balancing home life and family life on the one hand and work life on the other. The key issues that these women faced were self-esteem and the search for meaning. Women in our study who fell into the third phase of career development, what we called reinventive contribution, tended to be in the ages 46 plus. These women saw themselves as contributing to their organizations, their families, and their communities. They held an external locus of control, where personal and professional others have impacted their career choices. They viewed their career as an opportunity to be of leadership and service, and they tended towards work that provides opportunities to continue to learn. The key issues that women at this phase faced were recognition, respect, integration, and authenticity. I invite you to think about the career development stage that you are in and to reflect on the key issues that you are facing as part of your own development. What are the strategies that you continue to use? Where is your locus of control? Whether your career locus is internal or external. How you view your career and what are the ways by which you define your career success? Let me move us along to the paths of women's lives. I picked this quotation from Mary Catherine Bateson's Composing a Life book because it was so interesting and so evocative of the ways by which women's lives unfold. Let me read it out with you. 
At times, I pictured myself frantically rummaging through the refrigerator and the kitchen cabinets, convinced that somewhere I would find the odds and ends that could be combined at the last minute to make a meal for unexpected guests, hoping to be rescued by serendipity. A good meal, like a poem or a life, has a certain balance and diversity, a certain coherence and fit. The improvised meal will be different from the planned meal, and certainly riskier, but rich with the possibility of delicious surprise. Improvisation can be either a last resort or an established way of evoking creativity. Sometimes a pattern chosen by default can become a path of preference. I offer this quotation to us so that it gives us insight as well as inspiration that the paths that we choose, even though they may be improvised, can turn out to be amazingly growthful where we can learn new skills of leadership and of contribution, where it becomes not just a path of default, but a path of preference. I'd like to conclude this session with the following insights. Women can benefit by engaging in purposeful career development. That is by defining own success and finding work-life integration while remaining open to where their life paths and life circumstances take them. Embracing change and the unexpected can take us into areas that are amazingly growthful. I invite you to complete the homework assignment, which is to complete the defining own success exercise and completing the current and ideal life roles exercise and writing a reflection describing your insights from these exercises. At this point, we're at the course closure of our Women in Leadership Inspiring Positive Change course. The whole goal of this course was to inspire you to bring about change in your life and in your workplace and to lead your organization and your team, your family and your community so that you could bring about positive outcomes in the world around us. We started with focusing on women's strengths as leaders. We discussed next leadership identity, particularly focusing on your values and vision. The next couple of sessions, we focused on women's leadership at the top, first in terms of representation and second in terms of the barriers and challenges that sometimes face women in their advancement to senior leadership. In the next set of sessions, we focused on leadership tools for women. The first of those sessions was on self-confidence. The second on navigating organizational politics and gaining influence. And the third on negotiating effectively. And then we've closed the course by inviting you to engage in purposeful career development so that you could be most effective. It has been my pleasure to work with you over the duration of this course and to see how engaged you have been through our discussions and through our chats and through various other mechanisms provided through this course. I thank you for your participation and wish you the best for your enhanced leadership and your contributions to the world around us. Thank you.